Uh, I don't have a lot of I open I think we want to get uh, to our experts. Uh, I'll just say that Ooh. we organized this session because some of the most frequently asked questions that uh, I get and my team gets from constituents uh, are uh, related to tax filing. And, and you know, it's always complicated. There are always issues. But this last year has been particularly complicated because of uh, all of the changes caused by the, the COVID crisis. So, you know, we get all kinds of questions about EIS payments uh, uh, and how they relate uh, to, to our taxes. Small business owners have a lot of questions about, uh, about uh, the taxability of relief they've, uh, they've gotten. There are just so many new programs out there that have both helped us, but also complicated our lives that we thought it would be useful to get a couple of experts uh, on a Zoom with us to answer all of your questions. So thank you so much for, for joining. And, and I hope that this is going to be uh, in, informative uh, for you. So we've got, as you heard from DeAndre, uh, Eric Hassan from the, the Taxpayer Advocate Services uh, with, the, with the IRS and Monica Conover from United Way, which uh, runs an excellent program um, to uh, both help and advocate uh, for folks uh, dealing with complicated tax questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to them uh, and then we'll do the Q&A, which I assume will be the most important part. Uh, and of course, I'll stay on. Uh, I expect to learn a lot, but I'm also available uh, for any questions you all may have about uh, where we go uh, uh, in Washington uh, on tax policy or heck, anything else that you wanna uh, ask me about. So um, take it away. I think we're going to you first, Erica, is that right? Yes, thank okay. you, Congressman Mal Malinowski. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to be here with you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. My name is Erica Sun. I'm the local taxpayer advocate for the state of New Jersey. I work for uh, one part of the IRS. It's called Taxpayer Advocate Service. We're an independent um, uh, organization within the IRS. Uh, we help taxpayers, uh, individuals, businesses, nonprofit organizations with uh, any type of tax issue that they're having where they try to resolve it through normal channels with the IRS, but for some systemic reason, they're unable to get it resolved. Or if they're in a situation where they're, they're facing some sort of hardship, either because of the, what the IRS actions have been, uh, taken like liens or levies against them, or some, some, something is not working within the IRS. Um, and we also look at uh, tax administration problems from a big picture perspective. We look at uh, issues that are facing several different types of taxpayers, and we elevate that in a report to Congress every year. It's called the Annual Report to Congress. And we tell Congress the 10 most serious problems for tax administration and we propose different types of legislation to help um, resolve some of these issues um, and to better serve uh, taxpayers. Um, as you know, the IRS is not just a tax collection agency, but we also um, help distribute uh, financial benefits to individuals um, to give them some relief, such as the stimulus payments. So the IRS um, does many things. And, um, you know, unfortunately this year we faced um, very um, many difficult problems. Um, we, uh, most, many parts of the IRS are not, are not able to telework. Um, my organization is able to telework, but a lot of the, uh, prob the, a lot of the IRS is, has to be on site. And so for several months, um, certain parts of the IRS were shut down because of COVID. So for example, submission processing where you send in your tax returns um, they were had to shut down uh, for several months. And when they reopened, there was a huge backlog of returns. So even right now, there's about 7 million returns that are still not processed, paper returns. Um, there's about 5 million pieces of, of mail that has still not been opened. So this is, um, you know, we have limited number of uh, employees. Um, they have to practice social distancing. Um, and fortunately, um, you know, they're not able to do everything as quickly. So there's been huge, huge delays in terms of getting people their refunds. Um, and because the returns are not processed, they're unable to get their stimulus payments. And this is all compounded by the fact that the IRS has the oldest computers in the government. They're using a code that 
basically it's called assembly that nobody knows how to code anymore. And this code has been used to implement to, you know, two weeks after the first legislation passed for the stimulus payment, IRS had to jump into action and implement this code so that it could uh, distribute the stimulus checks to people two weeks right after the legislation was finalized. So they were able to get out to most people, but a lot of people did not get, especially people who needed the most, people who don't, you know, file tax returns because they don't have enough income. So, you know, stimulus payment one, a lot of people didn't get it. Two, they didn't get it. So um, there's just been a lot of problems and it's just ongoing. We've had these problems for the last 10 years because of the IRS computer systems are so old and they're just not able to compute all these changes. And also they pick up false positives. So people who have legitimate tax returns, they're not being processed, they're being stopped. And so it's just caused a lot of displays and problems for people. So I'm gonna do a, a quick presentation and uh, just go over the basics of our organization and then I'll take questions at the end. Okay, so this is the presentation. Everybody able to see it? I don't know if it's coming through. Yes, we can see it. Okay. All right. So, Taxpayer Advocate Service. This is the organization that I am part of. We have our leadership is the National Taxpayer Advocate. Um, um, the head of our organization is Erin Collins. Um, and she started March of 2020. She, um, prior to becoming the National Taxpayer Advocate, she was the Tax Managing Director in charge of KPMG's Tax Controversy Services Practice for the Western area until her retirement in April 2019. She has more than 35 experience, years of experience handling controversies at all levels of the IRS, including examination appeals and chief counsel functions, as well as representing both foreign and domestic corporations on a wide range of technical and procedural issues. Okay, so as I said, we're an independent organization within the IRS and we provide free services to eligible taxpayers. Um, we assist taxpayers with, who have problems with the IRS. We identify areas where taxpayers have problems dealing with the IRS. To the extent possible, we propose changes in administrative practices of the IRS to mitigate problems. Um, and we identify potential leg legislative changes to mitigate such problems. So um, every year, this time of the year, I go to Washington, D.C., and I meet with the New Jersey congressional uh, representatives, and I discuss um, uh, various legislative changes um, that would help make the IRS uh, better in terms of dealing with uh, tax administration problems that we're facing. Taxpayer Advocate Service has at least one office in each state, um, one in the District of Columbia and one in Puerto Rico. Um, right now, uh, they're planning on opening another New Jersey office. Um, my office is located in Springfield, New Jersey. Um, and normally, you know, we would be there, but we're all teleworking um, since March of last year. So we're working um, via telephone, um, but if it were not for COVID, we would be in the office um, and, um, we would be working um, in, in Springfield. Um, so as I said, we um, help taxpayers who are failing, uh, facing a problem with the IRS. Uh, taxpayer Advocate Service actually um, um, created the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Um, these rights did exist um, under the Internal Revenue Code, but the last National Taxpayer Advocate, she kind of consolidated it and um, put it together, the top, uh, the 10 Bill of Rights, and these are really important for taxpayers to understand, um, and I'll go through them in a little bit. We also have a system called Systemic Advocacy Management System, and um, basically, if there's some sort of problem that's affecting several taxpayers, you can input that problem into the Systemic Advocacy Management System, and, um, and somebody will contact you from that uh, division and um, talk to you about um, what, what they have found in their research, what they're working on, and um, it may even be included in the annual report to Congress. Um, so the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Uh, so these are really important in terms of understanding what your rights are when you're dealing with the IRS. Um, for example, the right to be informed. Um, this year, 
as I said, a lot of returns, legitimate returns were stopped and um, taxpayers didn't understand why their, their returns were not being processed. Um, and that's because the right to be informed wasn't really um, provided to taxpayers. Um, so even within the people who are in the IRS, we actually don't know why some of legitimate returns were stopped. Um, so the right to be informed is really important for taxpayers to understand, um, you know, whether they owe additional tax or if there's penalties, you know, and what the basis of that is, or changes to their tax um, assessments. Um, it's really important that the IRS uh, be able to provide that information in clear and um, straightforward, plain English. Um, another right that taxpayers have is the right to quality service. Um, so currently, the IRS has a level of service about, let's say, 20%. So the calls that they're receiving, um, only about 20% of them are being answered, unfortunately. Um, so the level of service is really a big uh, issue with the IRS, and that's because of um, limited resources. Um, unfortunately, the IRS doesn't have enough staff, and we don't have the technological um, tools that we need to really help taxpayers um, our computers are just not able to handle uh, the load that it has right now with all the changes. And um, even when I look at the computer, I, it's like DOS, like it's even much worse than DOS. I, there's no way for me to look at a taxpayer's account, like a 360 uh, view perspective of them. So that's another thing. Um, you know, if you have something, like if you believe that your tax assessment is incorrect, you should have the right to challenge the IRS's position and be heard a right to appeal the IRS's decision, um, finality, you shouldn't have ongoing audits, um, privacy, confidentiality, a right to retain representation, and also a fair and just tax system. So these are really important rights that you know the IRS needs to uphold. And we are trying to, although we are part of the IRS, we do see that sometimes these rights are not, are violated actually. And so we try to um, work uh, with taxpayers and help make sure that, you know, these rights are protected for them. So how can you contact Taxpayer Advocate Service? Well, you can work through Congressman Malinowski's constituent services. You can also contact us directly. Um, our intake line is 877-777-4778. Uh, um, you can contact them. You can also <clears throat> download a form, Form 911. It's available on the IRS website, irs.gov. Just type it in the search box, Form 911, um, and you can fax that to us. <clears throat> um, so when you do contact us, what we usually do is we put your information into the system if it meets our eligibility requirements. Um, generally, we ask that you try to resolve the issue um, through normal channels, and if you can't, then you know we'll try to help you, or if you're facing some sort of financial hardship will also try to help you. Um, once your case is assigned, your case advocate will work with you um, and stay with you until the issue is resolved. You can also have an, um, your accountant work with us. You can have a power of attorney form filled out um, and we can work with your power of attorney to try to resolve the issue. As I mentioned before, we look at tax problems from like a micro perspective with individuals and also from the macro, we look at the big picture. We try to fix these systemic problems um, by elevating them to Congress and um, through these reports, annual report to Congress and the objectives report to Congress. So the annual report to Congress, anyone can review it. It's um, available on the IRS website and it talks about the 10 most serious problems faced by taxpayers due to tax administration. So um, that's really a, a good report to see what issues the IRS is facing right now. Um, right, the IRS also has um, some operational in, um, information available. Um, they have information about um, you know, where they are in processing these uh, backlog paper returns. I think they're doing July right now. Um, and they have updates on their website. Um, this is more information about the updates for our organization, TAS. Um, we also have a redesigned Taxpayer Advocate website, and we have something called a Taxpayer Roadmap. Um, this shows you how complex the tax administration system is, and it shows you 
um, where you are in the process. So it's, it's a very interesting map. Um, if you're curious about it, um, it's kind of like the New York City subway map. We work with um, other organizations that help taxpayers. Um, for example, Taxpayer Advocate Service, we give grants to legal services to um, create something called low-income taxpayer clinics. Um, depending on your income eligibility, you may be uh, um, entitled to a free tax attorney who can represent you before the tax court. So they're called low-income taxpayer clinics. There's about four in New Jersey and there's a link to um, which low-income taxpayer clinics are available near you. We also have um, other programs. Uh, one of them is called Taxpayer Advocacy Panel, where we have an independent panel of citizen volunteers who um, give us information about um, problems that uh, taxpayers are facing, or ways to improve the system. And then here's more information resources available to you. Um, our, our website, um, our National Taxpayer Advocate, she has a blog where she talks about um, issues, um, current issues, and then we have our social media pages. So um, I can take any questions right now, if anybody has some. Okay, I see one hand raised. How do I do this? I think I will unmute you. Okay. Hi, Erica. Hi. Uh, Gino from Long Hill Township. Yes, hi Gino. Um, I appreciate you uh, being here presenting. Uh, a simple question, will this information be available like a replay of the uh, webinar? Because there's a lot of information that you put out. Yeah, um, if you yes. want, you yes. can, I don't know how it would work, Eric. I mean, you can just take my slideshow. Yes, so our office is recording this call right now and then after this call will be made available so you will be able to see a recording of this call and then also um, if you allow us to use your slides we'll also um, release that to everyone on the call. You're fading out. Can you talk a little louder? Do you hear me? Is this better? You kind of faded out at the end. Um, so we'll just be using both the recording and um, the slides after today's conversation. So look forward for that information in your email. I appreciate that. The question, the question I have is though, um, and I don't know if there's an answer here, but my wife is uh, one of the unemployed, self-employed people from New Jersey, and she needed income verification to get the correct uh, weekly benefits. And because we file with hand filled in forms, they wouldn't accept that at the uh, New Jersey DOL. So I tried to get a copy of the transcript from the IRS. And um, I take advantage of the extension of uh, filing so they didn't get the file until October. I owed money. So they processed the check, but there's no transcript. And I go online frequently and they're not available. They told me that um, the, the PO box we send the extension uh, forms to with payment is in a is in lo different location than the uh, location in Kansas City where they process the forms. So it looks like we're, we're gonna miss out on getting the uh, second stimulus because we didn't have a form filed. And I, I, really, don't, I really don't need the uh, credit in 2020. I, I appreciate what everybody else got in the beginning of this year. Um, but the question I have is, were the forms that were sent to Louisville and the check was processed, were those forms taken by courier to uh, Kansas City or US mail? Do I know that they're there? Okay. so. You, 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 when did you file your return? In October? I, I take advantage of the extension, October. Okay, 4th. so as I said, if you look on the IRS website on that COVID um, update, they're processing July returns right now. Wow. Fortunately, and as I said to you, um, I don't know if you looked at, you know, in the news, like in March when they shut down, they rented trailers and trailers and rented office space to hold all these paper returns. And they're now going through them. Um, if your check got cash, um, that's, they do that first. They'll check, they'll, they'll actually work on the returns with refunds first, cause they'll pay interest on those. And then they'll work on the returns with balance dues. They'll cash the check and then they'll process the return later. Um, your transcripts, there's all different types of transcripts. So the, there's the account transcript, which shows you like when you filed your return, when, what you reported for tax and what your payments are. That's one type of transcript. And all these, 
All these transcripts generally are available once your return is processed. The only transcript that's um, not kind of related to that is um, wage and income transcripts. And that's the third party information returns that are filed with the IRS. So for example, your employer, your banks, your financial institutions, they all file information returns with the IRS. And that information goes on the wage and income transcript. And so if you are a W-2 employee, that information is available on the IRS website. You can you know, log on to your account and you can sort of download your wage and income transcripts. And you can see you know, all your, if you forgot one of your tax, if you bought some stocks or sold some stocks and you lost one of those, that information, you can see that on the wage and income transcripts. And this is the information that the IRS uses, third party financial information to match with your tax returns to verify that the information on your tax returns is correct. So if you're looking for, uh, let's say the wage and income transcript uh, because you're, you're a wage in earner, then that information will be available starting I think about May. But if you're self-employed, then they're really, they don't really have that information. It's only available on your tax return. So once your tax return is processed, that information will become available on the IRS website, the transcripts. So uh, unfortunately, uh, if you're, are you trying to get a loan? Is, is that why you need the transcripts? No, uh, New Jersey would not, ex New Jersey unemployment would not accept the hand filled in documents that we um, sent. But that's been resolved, <laughs> I believe. They may want us to verify, they finally did accept and changed her uh, weekly benefits rate. But the question is we, now we are uh, people who aren't gonna get the second stimulus check, we're going to get a credit, which I'm not happy with. I'd rather have Okay, so, so the second stimulus check, they had to give that out by January 15th. If you did not get it by January 15th, what you, if you are eligible, if you were eligible for it, you need to report it on your 2020 return. So your first stimulus or your second stimulus or both of them, if you didn't get them and you were eligible for it, you should report it on the as a re, um, recovery rebate credit, you need to claim it on your 2020 return. And you should, then you will get your stimulus check. Thank you both for the first question. Um, we'll Erika, I have a question. Hold on one second. We'll switch over to our second guest. Um, a lot of the questions that may come up right now may be able to be answered by our second panelist. Um, so we'll oh, okay. here, and then we'll start with Q&A after um, our second panelist. Go ahead, Monica. Okay, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Congressman Malinowski for having me also. Um, I know the IRS has a lot of work ahead of them and I don't envy what they're going through right now. Um, so I work for United Way of Northern New Jersey and manage the uh, VITA program, which is Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. And we help folks with uh, low and moderate income folks to file their taxes for free. We do federal and state. Um, IRS certified volunteers that do this. Um, last year, obviously with the COVID coming in and shutting down our sites, we had to go virtual. Um, we were working with Dropbox and emailing and trying to get everyone's documents in and get them filed so that they could get their economic stimulus payments for 2020 uh, for the, the first round and then the second round. Um, so this year we, uh, didn't want to do go that we we knew we had to do virtual again this year. Um, didn't want to go the route of Dropbox, and we actually now have a uh, a virtual portal um, that is on our website. Uh, it's our website is www.unitedwaynj.org, um, and we have a website there where you can actually fill out the intake form upload your documents and we will have volunteers preparing your taxes. This uh, website was launched as of February 1st. Uh, we already have over 500 uh, people that have submitted their documents. We have our volunteers are very, very busy right now uh, preparing. Um, so that's available. And also obviously people who um, need help that did not get their EIP payments, obviously we can help with that. Uh, to make sure that they get credits for that. Uh, the, the returns are reviewed with the clients after they're completed before we will, they sign them before they're submitted so that we make sure that everything is accurate. 
uh, through Zoom. We try to, we're keeping everything socially distanced, but we also know that there are people that will not be able to do this. We know that there are folks that are not going to be able to upload their documents. So we do have some uh, limited drop-off appointments Again, keeping everything socially distanced, people coming in wearing masks, we come, we do appointments only, um, and people can call up and get their, come in for a drop-off appointment. Uh, we have one location in Somerville, and then we are um, in Franklin also, and Boundbrook. Um, and that's, I'm going to keep that short. So that's kind of what's going on with us right now, and that's a service. Uh, so anybody can come and, you know, like I said, low and moderate income so folks are focusing on. The other thing is, and I just thought of this, uh, myfreetaxes.com is a free service for anyone to file their taxes on their own. Um, you can file your federal and your state for free. Um, they have no income limit. If you are self-employed, you can also use it. Uh, this is a great uh, program that... Uh, is offered, you just need to go on there and request the link to be sent to you. So that's something else. And that's it. Thank you so much. Before we start our live question and answer portion, um, just a reminder for everyone on the call, please uh, submit your questions using the chat feature below. Um, we do have a list of names right now of people who do have questions. Um, so just to make sure we get to everyone on the call, um, please submit your questions using the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Please include your name and the town you're from. Um, our first question. I didn't receive, I'll read the first question from our chat. The person, um, mic is not working. I didn't receive EIP in 2020. How do I claim tax credit for a refund to be processed? And now go to either of our panelists, Erica or Monica. Um, I, I, I think I um, mentioned this before, but um, if you didn't get your EIP uh, one or two or both, then you can claim it on your 2020 return um, by, you know, reporting it as a recovery rebate credit. And I, um, if you should feel free to use um, the VITA or AARP um, to help you fill out your tax returns. Um, I really encourage everyone to electronically file uh, their returns um, because the, as I said in the beginning, the mail is just so backlogged. I don't know how quickly they're gonna catch up. So try to avoid mailing your paper return. If you do mail it in, make sure it's sent certified mail return receipt. But um, even amended returns, um, starting from 2019, you can file them electronically. And if you have like returns that you were not able to file, I think two years back, even like 2018 return, if you didn't, if you weren't able to file electronically, if you that you could you could file those electronically, depending on the tax return preparer. If mm -hmm. software allows you to file electronically for older years. So I think certain tax return preparers have, have that software. So try to avoid filing a paper return um, if, you, if you possibly can. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Joe. Joe, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Should I go ahead? Yes, sir, go ahead with your question. First of all, thank you very much for this webinar. It's, uh, it's been very useful. Uh, my, my issue is that um, I sent in my uh, check for taxes owed by the Jan July 15th deadline. Uh, it was the extended deadline for COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a long time, it had not been processed, and I kept checking. And uh, mm -hmm. I finally received a harshly worded message from the IRS that uh, I had late payment for uh, not paying my taxes and that the, the fines and penalties would be up to half of what I owe if I didn't pay by September 7th. So uh, a little bit panicked by that letter, uh, I got online and uh, with an electronic transfer paid uh, the amount owed plus some additional fines. In the meantime, uh, a few weeks after that, they cashed my initial check. So uh, in effect, I paid twice uh, the taxes that I owed. I have been in communication with the IRS uh, since August and um, what I would like to do is to apply that additional payment to my 2020 taxes. 
and uh, I've had no responses from the IRS. Um, I've sent certified letters and uh, uh, it's just been very frustrating. Is there some recourse um, for this? Um, yeah, I'm really sorry to hear that. I, I do apologize. It is really the, as I said, the backlog. There's just not, that we didn't have enough people um, to work, open the mail. And unfortunately, there are a lot of people who are in the similar situation. Um, I, you know, is it a lot of money? Uh, actually, it, it is it's quite a bit of money. And yeah. I guess my, my follow-up question would be, if in preparing my taxes, can I just say that I've paid uh, this additional amount in my third quarter and then um, hope for the best or would that not work? You know, I wish it would, could be it could be done like that, but things like are not that simple with the IRS. As I said, the computers just can't handle these type of transactions. It should, we should be able to have something as, you know, you know simple as having you, your extra payment go to the next year but the computers just can't do that. So I think what would happen is you would get your refund eventually um, back to you as a check. And then you would have to just make sure that you pay your, if you owe for 2020, pay that you know electronically, don't send a paper check and you will get your penalties abated. I mean, if you mailed it in by the due date, they should go by the, the date on the return on the, on the envelope. They're not if there's any penalties assessed against you, you should get those abated. Um, and if you don't get abated, um, you know, let's say, I don't even know what to do, tell you in terms of a time frame. Um, you can come to us, but um, you know, just um, yeah, just um, you. Um, I guess what you can do is you can fill out a form nine one one if you need your payment and you haven't gotten a response. Um, and send that in to us or um, call us at that number 877 777. I don't remember off the top of my head, but. No, uh, I have your number. Yeah, you can contact us. All right. Thank you. Receive. But I mean, yeah, I, a lot of people have faced that same issue. And, and I don't know what to say. Like, people have stopped payments because it took so long for them to process it. And then it turns out, you know, that they need to pay it again. So. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Russ from Chester. Russ, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Um, Erica, uh, are we able to reach out to you directly uh, after this call or is it just a, we go into a queue and whoever feels it? If you have a question and you're not sure if you want to fill out a 911, you can call me directly. My number is 973. Sorry, one more time, Erica. I'm sorry. 973. Yep. 921. Mm -hmm. 376. 973 921 376. Uh, 973 921 Great. Thank you. And do you have an email address or no? Um, so we have a general email address. And, and I do have access to it. So it's, uh, it stands for TAS, T-A-S, period, N-J, period, Springfield, at irs.gov. Great, thank you. Thank you both. Our next live question comes from Jeff. Jeff from Springfield, can you hear us? I, indeed, I can. Go ahead, sir. All right, Erica, here's, here's, a, here's one for you, but I'll bet this is going to come up quite a few times. Uh, my wife took a uh, minimum required distribution from her plan last March. When the CARES Act was passed, it allowed for uh, deferral. So the entire amount could be redeposited and not taken in 2020. We did that. We actually redeposited the entire gross amount, including the amount that went to the IRS, 20% withholding. I now have a 1099-R in front of me that shows the distribution and the tax, but how do I handle the, the uh, redeposit? Because we really didn't take a distribution last year. 
you know, unfortunately, I really can't answer questions like that. I don't really, I'm not really a tax law expert or a tax return preparer. And so I, I would say, um, I don't know, Monica, do you have any <laughs> recommendations? My thought is to use it as a, um, uh, we go as an adjustment. So um, almost like you're making a, a contribution back into your IRA again. All right, it's interesting because the, the provider actually has it listed on their books. When they, got the, the, when they got the redeposit, they have it listed as a rollover. Yeah, um, I, I have heard that that's how they are um, because it, for anybody to make sure that they, if anybody took it out because of COVID, they're, they're, they are marking them as rollovers and I'm wondering if that's what they, the same thing they're doing with yours. Yeah, the thing is, I don't know where how to handle that on a 1040. Yeah, without going, um, I can't. Uh, I cannot give tax advice. But my thought, like I said, my thought is, is that you're going to handle it as a uh, contribution to your back into your IRA. All right, so it becomes a wash. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next live question comes from Doris. Doris, can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. My question was, well, I had two actually. First of all, well, the second one was, can Monica put in the chat box her email addresses and phone numbers that she rattled off during her presentation? because I didn't get them fast enough. That's the first question, which came the second. And the next question was for Erica. She talked about uh, people having their tax forms processed from last July. People who are being doing, who will be doing the taxes for uh, tax forms for this, that are due, let's say by April 15th of 2021, when do you anticipate doing those returns? Oh, so are you talking about the current, like what, are we going to be able to process the current year, the 2020 uh -huh. return? But you're doing, you're doing, uh, you're six months behind with other people. So are we going to be behind them? Well, we had our computers reprogrammed to prepare for the 2020 return filing. So, um, you know, if you are filing electronically, the computer should process your tax returns electronically. But if you're filing by paper, it will take a longer time for us to process the paper returns. So if you're gonna do it electronically, how many weeks should we wait before we question where, the, where is the refund? Monica, is there, I think the electronic returns are processed pretty quickly. Um, I, I think the time frame is like three weeks, maybe less than 21 that. 21 days, yeah, they're saying up days. to 21 days, as okay. long as there is not earned income credit. Okay. Oh, you, you, should, you should check the IRS website, like, where's my refund? They have a tool that you can see. Let's tell you as soon, yep. And Monica, would you put in the email what you just said about the addresses uh, in Somerset and Downbrook, as well as the United Way website address? Eric, just put the website in there. Yeah. And um, we'll, pull, we'll pull all the information, um, such as the phone numbers. Thank you. And we'll draft it into our email that we send out after the call. So all mm -hmm. the information, including the video, the PowerPoint, contact information, all that will be in our um, follow-up email after this, okay? Okay. Oh, I wanted to thank the congressman because I had a problem with my return last year, and I did send in an information uh, slip to your office, and he did take care of it, and I got my refund back, so I was very happy. Thank you so much, Doris. Thank you. Our next live question, sorry, Tom. Our next live question comes from Nancy. Nancy, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Congressman, and thank you, Deandra. I have a technical question. How does a taxpayer get a tax issued to the IRS? Specifically, if two nonprofit corporations merge, why are both nonprofits allowed to continue? Why isn't it required to have the first 
nonprofit terminate its nonprofit status upon merger? So um, Congressman Malinowski's office, um, there's two IRS uh, representatives. I'm one of them. And the other person may be able to um, forward your question to the uh, a tax law specialist. Um, her name is Kate Hunyady. So okay. uh, if you forward your question to his office, um, they should be able to um, reach out to the IRS and maybe get an answer. Okay, thank you. And I'll send you a separate message, uh, Nancy, with the email address that you can okay, use. Okay, thank you. Of thank course. you. Um, our next live question comes from Ron. Ron, can you hear us? If not, oh, Ron, can you hear us? We might be having technical difficulties with him. Um, our next question, I'll come back to you, Ron, if you can hear us. Our next question comes from Diana. Diana, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for your patience. Go ahead. Yes, sorry. Um, so. Uh, I have a question for Erica. Erica, I'm a member of Win of the Spirit, which is a community organization in Dover, and we promote rights and responsibilities for new immigrants. And one of the things we do is, uh, is uh, educate people about how to pay taxes with the tax ID. My question is, are you having this information in Spanish, uh, the information you present to them? That is my first question. Um, there, I believe there may be a Spanish version of it. Um, I can try to find out and, um, you know, send it to you. Um, so why don't you, um, why don't you email me? Um, what, what is your first name? Diana. Diana, okay, so Diana, um, just say that you're from Wind of the Spirit and- um, Yes, I can send you, uh, and I can put in, in the box my information and then we can communicate. Okay. That was my, and then is my second question that maybe in not sure if the, if the Congressman office is thinking to maybe do the same thing in Spanish. Uh, for our Spanish speaking people, because we have many, many members in Dover and also uh, in, in many other towns, uh, Long Valley and in different towns that, that we have uh, Spanish speaking members. And they will be very interesting to, to hear from you regarding the tax, uh, tax component, because many people pay taxes with the tax ID number and in, in, in US Americans sometimes they don't realize that but we do those things and we have another question but I don't want to like take over but that, that is another question congressman if, if you're thinking to do this in Spanish. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that back if uh, of course, I couldn't do it in Spanish, and I don't have the expertise. Yeah, no, no, but we can anyway, help. <laughs> but I think if we could find uh, uh, somebody who has the expertise and the language skills, then then that that would be a really great idea. Yeah, we we definitely are, are happy to help with that. Good, thank you. Let's let's work on that. Thank you, yeah, Andre. Oh. I, one of the um. Is that, uh, that they they had 2019 electronic returns that are still not processed. Um, there there are several electronic returns that are not processed. They're probably not processed because either there's false positives, like there's something that's stopping the return from being processed. It may be totally legitimate, or there may be missing some forms, like an 8962 or a 1095A, which are healthcare forms. A lot of people were missing those forms. So if you have a return that's not been processed, that re refund has not been received from 2019, um, then um, submit a form 911 or go through Congressman Malinowski's office to submit an inquiry and um, we'll look into it. Uh, yeah, I, the IRS may say it's in, it's in process. Um, it, may be, it may be in process, but if it's been like, it's been like, um, you know, you file the return in April electronically and it's still not processed. Um, 
you can wait or you can, um, you know, submit a form 911 or, as I said, go to um, Congressman Malinowski's office to constituent services. It ends up basically in our office. Um, um, and so that, and, in, and if you're worried about filing 2020 because your 2019 is not processed yet, um, what we've been advising people to do is to put for your AGI, your adjusted gross income for 2019 as zero because if the 2019 is not processed yet, there's no number. So you could put zero and try to file your 2020 if your 2019 is still not processed. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, our next live question comes from Mark, Mark Kegers. Uh, yes, thank you, DeAndre. Thank you, Congressman, for setting this up. Uh, the first is a very simple question, which is, will there be an extension uh, for payment of taxes this year, uh, as there was in 2020 to uh, July 15th. Uh, and the second question uh, is um, uh, based on the CARES Act. Um, if um, somebody takes a distribution from an IRA uh, and uh, less than 59 and a half years old, which happens to be my case, uh, in order to uh, to pay bills when the, when the business wasn't coming in, uh, is there an exception to the penalty that one has to pay the usual 10% penalty on that distribution? Um, so with regard to the first question, I haven't heard of an extension, but it could change. They do make some sort of last sometimes decisions. So I haven't heard of any extensions to pay the tax um, as of yet, but I mean, you can always check the IRS websites and you can sign up for like updates from them. With regard to the second question, I, I'm, I don't feel qualified to answer that. I'm, I'm gonna see if maybe Monica can answer it for you. <laughs> yeah. So the 10% penalty is waived uh, for, this, for the withdrawal. Um, and then uh, there's, you can pay back over a three year period, what was withdrawn. Um, and then handling on, if you're, um, are you, if you're preparing your own taxes, and I have to tell you, I've not done this yet, but I know that's form 8915, and that's IRS, everything's in numbers, um, is what you would use. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. The next live question comes from Diana. Diana, can you hear us? Hi, yeah. I actually have two questions about COVID. Do the stimulus checks that we've all been getting count as either state or federal tax or are they gonna be non-taxable? That's question one. And two, if you received rental assistance, it's the same thing. Do you count that towards your income or is it income towards the landlord or it doesn't count as income at all? Well, it's the first question, it's not income. Uh, the stimulus checks are not income, but Monica, do you have a answer to a second question? The assistance is not income either. Okay, so neither one will count as income, do, so they won't count towards any kind of calculations for Medicaid or SNAP or... No. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Adriana. Adriana, can you hear us? DeAndre, are you saying Andrea? Yes, Andrea, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Thank you. Um, thank you to the congressman and thank you for you, uh, to you because uh, your, the team is excellent there. Um, Erica, you answered the first question regarding um, the extension, if there's going to be an extension, if there's any. <laughs> So that one is uh, is answered. Um, the second question I had, and I do have a few, um, was if you could speak on the notices regarding identity theft. Um, I work in a CPA firm, and uh, we have had an abundance of identity theft verification letters from clients. And when they try to attempt, and obviously we can't help them with that because it is identity uh, questions that you know could go from 20 years ago and we would not have that information so the clients themselves had to call and were not able to get through so the IRS letter would say please contact us you know within uh, 10 days of this letter or they gave them a date and they could not get through um, by that date 
So we had a lot of issues where their refunds were being um, held and not being processed because the identity could not be uh, verified. So can you speak on that? And if you know if the IRS is planning to do that again, if, is it because you know there's remote going on or what, what happened with that? Um, so are they not giving an option? I don't know, I haven't seen these notices. Are they not giving an option to send in by mail the responses? They cannot send it by mail. They actually have to call or go into an office and verify themselves. Okay. So and they can't go into the office to verify themselves? Um, some can, some can't because they're afraid of COVID. Well, um, I think I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, presentation that we do, the IRS does have a very low level of service. Um, maybe try to call early in the morning, like seven and avoid Monday and Fridays. Yes, I've let them know that they're you know, early in the morning, but just some clients could not get through. Um, I guess if you, if they've tried, um, then they, you can submit a 911. Okay, I will do that. Um, and to follow some of the questions that I had, um, just telling you a comment that the intake line has been really difficult to reach, you know that, um, and a practitioner as well, uh, the 1-800-829-1040, forget it, you know, I've been on the hold for hours and then get disconnected and things like that. So just commenting with maybe, you know, the congressman's office can do something about, you know, effective uh, communication there. Um, and then Erica, does the IRS have anything in place for COVID-19 in case, you know, these, the COVID-19 spikes or the strands affect the IRS workers again and they have to shut down? Because that's another concern I have. If this happens again, you know, we're going into March and that's when they shut down last year, we'll Will this affect the processing for 2020, obviously? And what, what happens with the backlog? You know, you're going to be talking about two years of backlog then. Well, so I, there is like a IRS webpage where they give updates on uh, COVID, um, things that are happening with COVID. And you know, I think they are trying to do the best in terms of protecting their employees, um, trying to, uh, you know, with the social distancing rules, um, I, I don't know exactly what the emergency backup plans are, but, um, you know, right now they are just, um, they're behind, they're trying to do the best they can. Um, you know, we're looking to Congress for, you know, increasing the IRS budget to help modernize the computers, um, to hire more employees, um, you know, try to see if we can, um, give the IRS the tools and resources for them to um, do the work of 150 million taxpayers. Yes, thank you. And, and I appreciate the, um, you know, the stress that the IRS is under. Um, we just, you know, as CPAs have been also feeling that, you know, with our clients calling up and being stressed out, not getting the refunds. And like the gentleman said that he didn't have his check cashed and then sent in another one. The IRS was telling people not to do that, but, you know, taxpayers panic and they don't know. So, and then a question for Monica, um, regarding the income limit threshold that for, you know, filing people, can you give us that and explain a little bit? That's a really tough question. <laughs> I mean, I think we say low, low income and then moderate is, you know, it really depends on the situation because somebody could have been making, obviously, and especially now with this pandemic, somebody that was earning a six figure last year is, could not be doing it this year. So it, it really, we say moderate, New Jersey is really expensive to live in. Um, so it's, <clears throat> um, I would say depending on the number of family members, probably the highest we would usually go is about 80,000. But then it really depends on the situation. I mean, I've had families that you know, the mother had cancer and they had, you know, it's, it's really, it's a conversation with me. So they it should comes down contact to it. You. They should contact you. For yeah, sure. they should contact me directly. Okay. And then the other thing is the security on the portal. Um, how is that? How does that work? Because, you know, again, with this identity theft and so many returns being uh, processed, um, you know, not by the actual taxpayer. Mm -hmm. How does that work? What kind of security or can you speak of that? You know, it was put together by a digital person and I don't know anything about that stuff, but I would tell you. 
<laughs> and their taxes. So, um, but I would tell you that we were very obviously concerned and we wanted to make sure that we kept everybody's information safe following the IRS guidelines because we do have the, um, the security guidelines that we do have to follow. Um, and the only people that have access to that, that information would be our IRS certified preparers. So um, the, the information is secure. Okay, thank you very much, lady. Thank you, everyone. Our next question comes from Bill from Somerville. Bill, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Sorry about that. I was trying to unmute myself. Um, Go ahead. I have a, uh, sorry about that. Um, I have a different type of question. Um, I put money into a dependent care reimbursement account. You know, um, I've done it for a few years. And uh, when the pandemic hit, they allowed us to stop putting money into it back in July. And I immediately did. Unfortunately, um, I was not able to use all of those funds because of uh, the pandemic. Um, I've done some research and the IRS uh, says that any funds not used are gonna be forfeited. Um, they have offered a grace period of an extra two months. Well, um, the, the virus is still raging and I am not gonna be able to use it again because I'm not, I'm not gonna use my, put my children in the dependent care situation right now. And so I'm at in danger of losing these funds and I'm um, just wondering if there's anything that can be done to kind of help reimburse uh, or get this money back. And I'm, I'm sure this is an issue for a lot of people that are out there um, that have this uh, dependent care situation. Um, I'm sorry, I don't really know the answer to that question. I think that might be something that um, the, the um, the IRS uh, liaison, um, Kate Hanyadi might be able to answer. Um, Eric, maybe you can pass along that question to Kate. Um, or I can, let me, I mean, let me email her. I'll send her an email actually. So the question is, how do you get your dependent care payments back? Correct. There, there is, you know, by the time they let us uh, change our dependent care contribution, we had already accrued a lot. Um, but now we're not going to be able to, to use it. Um, and again, it's nice that the IRS gave us an extra two months, but I'm sorry, January, February, March, April, May, everything's still going on. We're not, and we're not going to be able to use it. So I'm going to lose a significant amount of money um, because of the pandemic. And I'm not sure the IRS is taking that into consideration, even though they're offering a grace period. Um, can you send me that, your information to my TAS email address, and then I'll forward it to um, Kate, our um, IRS liaison, and see if she can get an answer to that question? Yes, I can do that. And um, I'm sorry, I have your phone number. I didn't get your email address. Um, so you can just say that this, you were on the call with um, co the congressman, um, tax forum seminar and then just um, send it to TAS, T-A-S. I'll just do it on mm -hmm. the box. Let me just send it to everyone. Okay. It's tas.nj.springfield at irs.gov. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay, great. I will send you a separate email and uh, like I said, I've been working with uh, different people on it and unfortunately not been able to get some resolution to it. So. Okay. And Bill, check your chat. Oh, thank you. And Bill, check your chat feature. I'll be sending you an email for someone in our office as well, okay? Yep, sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from Melis. Melis, I, make sure, I, want, to make sure, I want to make sure I'm not saying your name incorrect. Um, there for Melis. Um, yes, um, I had my taxes filed by my accountant electronically in March, have not gotten my refund. I did get the first stimulus payment. I didn't get the second stimulus payment. And when you go to your website, you can check on your taxes because they've already changed it to two. You can only check on your 2020 taxes. 
Oh, okay. However, there is a way, by the way, for these people on the call to get through to a real human being. I have directions here. It's a 10, 10 step process. You have to press specific numbers when they, for each question that's asked and eventually you do get to a human being. So um, I'm happy to share that as well. It's a little insider information on the QT, um, but they're not able to help me either when I got through. So any ideas? So you can submit on form 911 to our office or you can go through constituent services to um, the Congressman's office and we can okay. look at your account. Um, did you receive any letters from the IRS stating like um, we're missing these forms or something? They needed one more form that was back in May and that was done the same day by my accountant. And so that's what's confusing because the one, I did get the one stimulus check, but not the second. And they and when I got through to the IRS, they have no idea what's going on with my taxes. They have not, quote, been processed yet. And they were filed in March electronically. So you, your first stimulus payment was probably based on the 2018 return because right. if that return was on file, they, they, they used that information to send you the first stimulus. But if it wasn't available, then they based on the 2019 return. The second stimulus payment was based on the 2019 return, but your your return hasn't been processed yet because it was missing a form. So when you send in your um, you know, inquiry about your refund, make sure that you attach that form because although you sent it into the IRS, um, when we send the referral to that part of the IRS, we would still need that form so that they have everything um, that they need to move ahead and process your return. They may be working on it right now, but because they're so delayed that it's just taking them time. So now they said um, that all those 2019 returns that weren't returned were supposed to be done in March is a standard um, thing I've heard. Is that still correct or not correct? Uh, can you, they were supposed to be done in March. I'm not sure. Yes, all returns that weren't filed, the IRS guy said that they're supposed to all be done by March, which is not, like, I don't understand why you're not keeping within your own rules and your own bill of rights about communication. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, we there's different parts of the IRS and um, the one department that seems to have all these, um, if there's a form missing, it usually goes to the errors department, error resolution. And that department was one of the departments that actually had people physically on site and they were shut down for several months. And then when they reopened, they could only have like 5% of their employees working. And if somebody got sick, they had to shut down the facility and then clean it and then bring people back again. So they're months and months behind. And so we are working with them and um, to send them the information that, that they may have already received, but what we do is we send it to them. We say, okay, here's the form, you know, that was missing from the return originally. Please process this return. And they're about 6,000 cases behind. So when we send them a referral, um, what we do is we identify the problem, which business unit of the IRS um, can fix the problem. And we send them something called a referral. We say, here's the problem. Here's the information you need to correct the problem. Please um, resolve this issue. When we send them that referral, they tell us they have 6,000 cases that they're behind. On. So it takes like three months for them to complete a referral, unfortunately. So there are many people who have cases in my office who have been waiting. Like when we when we learn about their issue, it, it it's we didn't know that they had this problem, um, but then they tell us they had this problem since April. And then we get the problem in like November and we still have to wait three or four months for the error resolution department to process the return. They only have so many employees that can work these problems, unfortunately. So they are doing it, you know, first in, first out, basically. Um, we can elevate certain um, cases to them if it's like they're facing eviction, they're facing utility shutoff, those kind of cases, um, we can elevate them and move them ahead of the thousands of people who are still waiting for their return to be processed. But unfortunately, it is sort of like a manual process and people have to go through these pieces of paper one by one. And, you know, they still have like 5 million pieces of mail. They still haven't, un they haven't opened 7 million paper returns they haven't processed, unfortunately. Um, 
And, and if you make one mistake, unfortunately, these returns are delayed in terms of processing. And it's just, it's, it's really difficult for everybody and it's frustrating. Um, and unfortunately, the IRS can't even give you that information to say, oh, you're missing this form. A lot of people don't even know if, what form is missing, um, you know, that, they're, that they need to send to the IRS. Um, and we don't even know. We searched the, and we're trying to figure out what's, what was missing so that we can send everything to the business unit so they can complete the referral. So it is all around very difficult and it does go basically to the problem of the IRS computers are just are old. They're not equipped to handle 150 million taxpayers. On top of that, two, three stimulus payments that they have to program for these checks. The employees, we don't have enough workers. You know, We don't have enough people to service all these calls. There should be somebody answering your calls. You shouldn't have to wait and get disconnected. You know, you should, if they can't answer your calls, it should go to, to uh, answering service where they return your calls some, somehow, some way. And also, the online services should be much better for you to be able to see what's going on with your account, know exactly what's going on. The capabilities are really just terrible. I mean, your financial institutions do a pretty good job of giving you all this information. The IRS is not able to do any of this, um, you know, and Congress has cut their budget, you know, over and over. And so we really don't have the resources to really fully service people in the way that they should be serviced. And, you know, unfortunately, and, and it's just a terrible problem that's been going on for a long time. So hopefully, um, you know, we can get some, um, you know, the computers improved and modernized so that we can better service people and fix these problems with the returns that just seem very basic. Thank you so much. Thank, and thank you, Congressman, for setting um, this up for everyone because it is helpful to, to be able to hear um, this information. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I know there's a few um, things that relate to casework that's helped with any uh, federal agency um, that you may need help from our office. I'm going to send a link around to a web portal on our website. Just fill out the form there and I'll get you in contact with someone in our office that can help you with this. Um, we still have a few more people on the list. We're going to try and knock them out um, in this last little bit of our call. So we just try to limit your question to one question or um, ask your questions all at the first so we can try to knock them out. Um, our first, our next question comes from Om. Om, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead, sir. Uh, well, my question was pretty much uh, answered during the presentation. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Um, uh, um, Representative Melanoski, appreciate what you're doing for the community. Um, tr I'm truly, truly appreciative. Thank you. It comes from Tatiana. Tatiana, can you hear us? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, my question is, uh, I got the, the, that extra $600 a week for the unemployment um, back in July before it expired. And I just got an email with the 1099G that it said there was a, no option to withhold the 10% benefits for taxes um, and that I'm responsible for paying any required federal taxes. So my question is, is it actually, is, is there a, is there a actual tax due for that extra $600? Because I've been using um, TurboTax 2020 and there's like nowhere to put it other than to say like, yeah, this is my 1099G and this is what I paid the, you know, this is what the state withheld, um, you know, from my state benefits. And Farika, you want to, I can answer that. Um, so unfortunately, it's only, you have to report the full amount, the 600 that you received weekly, and it's only the 10% that was withheld from your unemployment. So um, you're gonna have to pay tax on that 600 also for federal. Okay, is there, uh, is that not included in that? Like, I mean, I, I wasn't, okay, so, so I'll have yeah. to how much I got extra. Well, the, it should have all been on the 1099, it wasn't on the 1099 all online. Well, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I, I didn't actually, I, I'll, I can go back and, and like calculate it out. Um, I had assumed that it was all on there, but it, the email made it sound like it, it wasn't, so I'm not sure. Yeah, as far as I know, it should have all been reported together. I have not seen a 1099 yet, 
um, this season, but as far as I know, it should all be together. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, 10% is only on the unemployment, not on that extra 600. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our next live question comes from Jumana. Jumana, can you hear us? Hello, yes. Um, but thank you for doing this. Um, yes, I have a question about the child tax credit. Uh, what is the income limit for that this year? Has it changed? And the amount, has that changed from last year or is it the same? Um, the income limit is uh, married is uh, 400K and uh, all other is 200K. And it, it's 2000 uh, for each child. And then the additional child tax credit is 1400. And that's for up to age 17. Okay, great. Just, let me, if I could chime in there, we're trying to increase that. Hasn't happened yet, but it's in President Biden's That's what proposal. I was hearing on the news, that that yeah. might be a possibility, but I suppose so that, it's not for this year. Yeah, it's a strong possibility. It's something okay. I support, um, but obviously we haven't passed the bill yet. Uh, and that would be a fully refundable credit. So that would be the difference for folks making, I think, well, we'll have to decide not up to $200,000, but probably more up to like sixty-five, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 to make it uh, fully refundable. Um, that's a, it would be a huge deal in my view. It would, the experts say, would cut child poverty in America in half. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our next question comes from Kevin. Kevin, can you hear us? Absolutely, DeAndre, thank you. Hello, everyone, and hello, Congressman. Um, Erica, thank you so much uh, for holding the space talk on taxpayer issues. Uh, my name is Kevin Escobar. Um, I am a member of Wind of the Spirit Immigrant Resource Center. We are a community organization based in Dover. Um, I'd like to bring attention to a huge group of taxpayers that are often overlooked, uh, but at this time more than ever are essential, undocumented immigrant taxpayers. Um, my family actually comes from Washington Township. Um, both of my parents have been residents since the 80s. Um, in 2005, they began their LLC registered glorious cleaning service. Since then, my family has paid um, hundreds of thousands uh, in state sales tax um, contributions that we've made diligently over these 15 years. And, uh, you know, my family is just one of many millions of uh, essential workers who are currently working hard, um, you know, during one of the nation's worst crises in history. Uh, my question, Congressman, um, is on behalf of myself, my family, our membership, and the millions of undocumented essential workers. Uh, will you support and vote the path to citizenship for all, including essential workers on a federal level? This is an important issue um, to myself, advocates as well. Just today, um, many advocates from our organization and others participated in an action outside of your district office urging you uh, to support a humane immigration policy for these essential workers. Um, so my question again, Congressman, is will you support this initiative and support the millions who have worked the country to keep, who have worked to keep the country running uh, and who are at this time unable to change their status? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for raising that and, um, and for the work that your wonderful organization does. Answer simple, it's yes. Uh, I very strongly support immigration reform that would include a pathway to citizenship for folks who've been in this country, who are paying taxes, who are obeying our laws, who are contributing to our society, working hard, often doing the toughest jobs, often doing the most dangerous jobs, the jobs that cannot you cannot zoom in. Um, and, you know, I, it's the right thing to do. It's the pragmatic thing to do um, because the more people come out of the shadows, the more taxpayers we will have. Uh, long term, it's probably one of the best ways to save Social Security and Medicare uh, because immigrants tend to be younger. They're working, younger working people. So they're at the age where they're going to be contributing to the system. Um, I want to focus immigration enforcement on people who are harming other people, committing crimes and, and doing things that um, 
that that obviously uh, uh, violate the the compact, right? Um, you come to this country, you obey the law, you respect uh, uh, the rules. But if, if people are doing doing the right thing, it's in all of our interest, I think, um, to as part of immigration reform to help them come out of the shadows. Uh, Joe Biden's support is proposing a plan like that. It's going to be introduced. Uh, in Congress relatively soon. You know this is controversial, uh, although it used to have a lot of bipartisan support. Uh, we passed something like this in the US Senate with a lot of Republican support in addition to the Democrats uh, just six or seven years ago. And uh, I see no reason why we can't do it again. Thank you so much, Congressman. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Our next question comes from Ralph. Ralph, can you hear us? Ralph, there you go. Yeah, hi. Um, the question was really, uh, probably doesn't have an answer right now, but uh, it's about the SALT deductions. Mm -hmm. Just wondering whether or not there's any word or any thoughts about uh, giving us back our SALT deductions at some point. Yeah, well, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I can't I read on it. <laughs> so the, the answer is we, we, we passed a bill in the House to fully restore the SALT deduction. Uh, I was uh, one of the people fight, fighting for that. I got our leadership to make that commitment and we passed the bill. Uh, but then we had the US Senate to deal with and, and you know uh, what we were facing there. So the answer to your question is we will get our SALT deductions back in full or in part when we can either uh, get 60 votes in the US Senate for a tax bill that would include that, right? It's not gonna happen as a standalone bill. That's probably too much. But when we move tax legislation, if we can get 60 votes in, in the Senate for something that includes a measure on SALT and the House will insist on it, I, 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 can, I can promise you that. Uh, or we, we get rid of the filibuster in the Senate and pass it with 50 votes plus one. We certainly have 50 votes plus one for this. Um, you know, this has become, it's not partisan in New Jersey. Everybody in New Jersey, New York, in this area, Republican and Democrat recognizes this has to be done. It's become pretty partisan in the rest of the country, which complicates uh, getting it through the Senate, even when we have Democratic control. Um, but bottom line, uh, I am committed to fighting like hell for this. Uh, whether it's easy or hard doesn't matter. My job is to fight for it. Um, we did it in the House. We will insist that any tax bill that we send to the Senate uh, include SALT provisions. And then we'll have to uh, fight through the thicket of these complicated rules in the Senate that you know have made a lot of things difficult over the last few years. But it's- Fully well, we understand. <laughs> We got a better, we have a better chance now than we did last year, but I also want to be realistic with you. It's not like, you know, this isn't something that, that we can just fork through because of the filibuster and, you know, just very few things we can do there right now with just 50 votes plus one. The relief bill is one of them, but a tax bill would be more complicated. Okay. No, no, I understand the priorities. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Ralph. Our last question comes from Carol. Carol, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, hi, Tom. Thanks for doing oh, this. Sure. Uh, real quick question. If uh, the stimulus package is passed and the $1,400 is going to come out, um, is it contingent on your 2020 return or will it just be like um, the other ones that just automatically came through? if you have uh, registered electronically filed previously? Uh, you should get it automatically. Like if you're in the system electronically, um, uh, Monica, Erica, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it, 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 should, it should come through. Uh, so, and then- Yes, we're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. And then of course there will always be exceptions, right? And that's why we're here. Uh, and, and we have lots of constituents who've come to my office, as you know, 
um, looking for help to, to get checks that should have arrived but didn't. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll work through those issues. But for most people, uh, if you got your check electronically, if you got the, the payment electronically before, then that means you're in the system and, and it should work again. Okay. Can you find some money for the IRS? Well, that was gonna be my, that was gonna be my closing statement. Are oh, okay. Statements now. <laughs> okay. Thanks. <laughs> thank you, Carol. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you for staying a little extra um, and just being patient. With us for thank time. you, Congressman. Um, before we wrap, I'm going to give a chance for Erica and Monica to say a few closing remarks or anything else before we kick it over to the congressman and close it out. Um, Thank you, DeAndre, and thank you, Congressman, and um, all your constituents who uh, came today. Really appreciate um, your patience. Um, and um, yeah, any money that you can give the IRS to improve services, um, really the money that IRS gets, it goes back to the you know, American people um, of you know, stimulus, roads, schools, et cetera. Um, so if we can have a more efficient system, we can better service um, the constituents. Um, and I thank everybody for your patience. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank you, Congressman Eric and DeAndre. And Erica, you have uh, really been on the firing line for this. I kind of got to sit back. <laughs> and and um, but please, if you have, uh, if you need help with getting your taxes done, um, please reach out to me. And uh, we have a ton of volunteers that are there to help you. Um, so please give us a call or email us, and uh, we'll help you out. Great, thank you both. Uh, this has been really, really helpful. Uh, I, I hope uh, we answered uh, most, if not all of the questions that, that you guys had. Uh, and, and yes, I was gonna close by uh, <laughs> noting uh, Erica's uh, uh, entreaties to, to me uh, and to all of us to support uh, the IRS. It's obviously not the most popular thing in the world, right? Um, you don't see a lot of politicians putting up campaign ads saying, I want to give more money to the IRS. But it is absolutely the right thing to do. Um, we, we, we've seen on this call the consequences of starving important government agencies of, of funding. Uh, this is part of a kind of larger anti-government spirit that has been um, flowing across uh, the land for the last 20 or, or 30 years. And there's been a lot of, I think, cynical politicians who play to that anti-government spirit to do things that may be good for them in the short term politically, but ultimately are bad for us because we have these essential agencies that operate like they're in the 19th century. Um, and the IRS is, by the way, one of the few federal agencies where if you put money in, taxpayers actually save money because uh, they'll be better able to go after uh, tax cheats, particularly uh, those at the upper end of the income scale. Um, it's easier to go after middle class and working class people uh, with audits uh, with, with a small budget, but to really go after the big tax cheats, we need to support the IRS more. And if we did that, um, again, we would save money and we'd be able to either do more um, through federal spending or cut taxes for, for, for most of us. So. Uh, it's one of the smartest investments we can make, even though it may not be the sexiest or most popular idea. And um, I, I intend to use my voice in this year's appropriation season as we are writing the budget for all these agencies for, for the coming year to advocate for more funding. Um, so hopefully the crisis we've been in is the crisis we needed to convince us that that's necessary. So thank you all so much. Uh, and obviously please stay in touch with us uh, as problems arise. We, we did this in part to try to answer a lot of questions in a short period of time, but obviously my, my team is there available to you all uh, if, uh, if you have problems or questions going forward. So thank you everybody. Thanks Erica, thanks Monica. Thank you DeAndre for moderating and I'll, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, stay safe. Bye.